All right, let's 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 open with prayer. Dear God, thank you for this day to come together. Be with each of those mentioned here uh, for prayer concerns. Be with their families. Be with our church. Be with us in our search for a pastor. Be with our community, our state, our nation, and our world. And all the many things we deal with. Help us to depend on you to get us through. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Oh, you want to? We got an announcement there. Huh? You got an announcement. Oh yes, I got one more announcement. We can say this one out loud. <laughs> Bush just shared with me that on some of our lessons <laughs> on YouTube, one of us had 266 views, oh. and one of us had 221 views. Oh, wow! Wow! Woo. wow. So, just spread the That's word. So maybe we'll maybe we'll go from. I don't know. It'd have a doubling effect. <laughs> it may be like the virus. You know. <laughs> 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 Everybody that watches on YouTube, Macdonald Presbyterian Church, if you're in our neighborhood, come on down. <laughs> Glad to hear that. All right. So this week I'm going to try to make up for last week. Jackie called me last week, but it was a kind of last minute. And I already had something planned with my son, so I wouldn't to get to So I'm going to, I'm going to go back and look at John 1, because I understood y'all did some discussion. So I'm going to look at John 1 today in John 4, because I think we can cover those in our 45 minute allotment if we keep moving. So a couple of things I wanted to do about the Gospel of John. Um, just some interesting to me pieces of information about the Gospel of John that we all should know. That the Gospel of John is a little bit different than the other Gospels. If you read it, you pick up on that. If you study it, you pick up on that. If you study it really hard, you really pick up on that. Uh, we actually call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic Gospels because they have a lot of common denominators. John has some, but it's uniquely presented in a lot of ways. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of times considered the fourth Gospel. You got the synoptics in the fourth Gospel. Or you got John, whatever term y'all want to put to. If you look at the whole book as a whole, and that's a basically, you want to understand the book of John? To understand chapter one, you need to read chapter 21. To understand chapter 21, you need to read one, and you need to read everything in between. <laughs> <laughs> and if you really want to study something, that's what you should do, you know? You don't want to do like you might have done when you're in school, read the first chapter of a book and the last chapter of the book in your book report. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might miss something. Yeah. <laughs> Your teacher might figure that out. Uh, uh, now, I wonder how I knew about that. Uh, I didn't like to read a lot of those. I, learned, I didn't like reading stuff. I didn't want to read. That's what that was. But I learned to enjoy reading better. Uh, so, but anyway, when you look at the text, there's most scholars agree there's like three additions to the text. That were added at some point. One is the prologue, which we're going to read today. That's uh, verses chapter one, verses one through eighteen. And even though almost all scholars feel like that was, it's because of the words that are different compared to the rest of the book. It's never known to circulate any manuscripts without prologue. So there would be those that would argue, well, it's, it's not an addition. It may be that the original writer grabbed it from somewhere and inserted it a hymn like and made it his own. That's another possibility to fit it into his presentation of the gospel. Another another addition is in chapter eight. It is the story that's only told to John, and that's the woman caught in the dog. Most all scholars agree that, that was that was not written by the original writer. That was probably added at a later date. And I think the reason they do that, if I remember correctly, and studied that several times, is that it's not in all the manuscripts. So it's a later edition. The other thing that's a later edition is the appendix, and that's chapter 21. So, so when was the book written? Most of the Gospels were written, if you look, the Gospels were written between 60 to 100 AD in that time frame. You can pretty well often say that that's when they were written. Now you got to remember, Jesus died somewhere around 30. So it's been a few years before we get this written down. 
uh, the, the earliest they think John was probably written probably would have been about 75 to 80. Some people think it was written as late as 100 AD, which if that's the case, that makes it the latest. A lot of what's described in the book fits well with some of the same times as Matthew. Which Matthew's dated closer to more than that. So Mark is Mark is generally considered to be the earliest, around sixty. So. Um, interesting thing about John the Baptist. Um, you know, at one time I was Baptist and I thought, you know, John was a Baptist, wasn't he? They said he was a Baptist. John the Baptist. Well, he was misnamed. He wasn't. You never read any verse that says John the Baptist. Or John the Presbyterian. <laughs> it doesn't have the same range to it. He was, he was the first, he apparently first man, because the churches didn't pop up for a long time. All right. But John the Baptist because of baptizing. But guess who he doesn't baptize in John? John. He doesn't baptize Jesus. Right. Now, it's, there's a little bit of an allusion to it. It talks about a dove coming down. But it doesn't mention in John that, that John actually baptized Jesus. And a lot of people have speculated that, that the writer didn't see that Jesus needed anybody to baptize him mm -hmm. because he's God incarnate. Why does he need to be baptized and forgiven of sins? Now, the other Gospels all have Jesus being baptized, just like any other person that's coming to, for repentance. He's baptized. John apparently had a problem with it. It's alluded to a little bit. John the Baptist talks about Descending like a dove, which in the other seems to be associated with the baptism and, and some one of the other gospels. The other thing that this book doesn't do, of course, it doesn't have it does not have a, a birth story. It goes way back. So when God he started with God, it doesn't have a it does not have a birth story. Those are in Matthew and Luke. It does not have a birth story. And guess what Jesus' name, mother's name is in the book? Mother. Never mentions that she's married. Uh, which may go along with why there's not a birth story. Jesus' mother doesn't appear to be nearly as important as Jesus, God incarnate. We, this book emphasizes Jesus and Jesus and God and ties them together. It's not going to make a big deal about it. his mother's his mother. She's just like another mother. It's interesting, though. Guess who it does name? It does have Philip tell us that here's Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Name's the father. The other thing that's interesting, the father that's Again, that's a masculine name, doesn't mention Mary, although there's some there's some Marys mentioned in the book, but the mother's not for it. And the other interesting thing, if you look, when we talk about the word, which we fix again to logos, in the Old Testament, a lot of times when they were talking about God and spirit of God, a lot of times they used the word wisdom. When the wisdom writings. The Greek word for that, I'm not doing the Greek letter, is Sophia. This is a masculine Greek noun, and this is a feminine Greek noun. I'll let you do what you want to do with that. <laughs> what but, do you suggest? <laughs> <laughs> let the writer speak for himself. Uh, this writer very much emphasizes God the Father. Yeah, in, in some modern circles of Christianity, we're trying to degenderify God. And I'm not sure we should have said a gender. God. I'm not arguing for that one way or the other. But in this gospel, he makes a point of God the Father. He does not say God the Mother. In this gospel, he does get Jesus' dad's name put down, but he doesn't put down, he doesn't list the mother's name. Isn't that interesting? You might not, if you read that whole thing, you, if you didn't stop and think about that, you wouldn't think about that, would you? 
Because you already know Joseph is his father. You already know Mary's his mother. So you, would, you might not pick on the little nuance, but that's mentioned. So, uh, and then we also have a disciple named in John Nathaniel on the gospel he's in. Not in any other list. So, some interesting things about the book. I guess that's uh, Gospel of John trivia. Right now, the other real interesting thing about it in the Synoptic Gospels, how long is Jesus' ministry? For 30? No, one year. One year. Oh. According to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, huh. Jesus' ministry was one year. If you read through it, it's all taking place in one year. Where we get three from is Gospel of God. There's clearly three Passovers, so there's three years. It's the only one that has it for three years. So was Jesus' ministry one year or three? We'll make it two. I'm going to say three. I'm going to say three. You both three. Since John said it was three. But well, you three. know, when, when he was born and the stars and all the, right. of course, that could be all false too, but um, that is a ministry. Right, right. Well, and a lot of people have thought that Jesus may have only lived for about 30 years. Because if you, if you read John, you want to extend it. Uh, it's some of these facts don't really matter. And when you look at John, we're going to start talking about some of the things that really matter to John. So, but I just think some of those things are interesting to look at if you really want to study the gospel of John. The other thing, though, you study the gospel of John in and of itself, you read through, you see there's three Passovers. You would just assume there was three Passovers in the other three books. And by the time you go to those books and you read them, and you just read about one, you'd forget John had three. Most of the time you do, right? That's the that's good thing about reading commentaries by scholars because these people dig at the facts. Then we, we gloss over some. Sometimes we only look at the Gospels the way we remember a preacher preaching. <laughs> and I did a sermon one time. I actually did a, a youth revival one time when I was in seminary. I was a, I was a youth minister at the church, so I did a youth revival. And you have to be careful about what people hear. I did, a, I did this sermon for youth and then this lady, who was very precious, like couldn't hear very well. <laughs> she didn't sit far back. She couldn't hear very well. She came up to me and said, she said, I totally agree with you. People should never go fishing on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that? Not only have I fished on Sunday, but I haven't talked about not doing it. <laughs> I have no clue. That came from. <laughs> but she was very thankful that I mentioned it. <laughs> so sometimes, whenever we hear a sermon, we hear what we want to hear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? Sure. Sometimes when we read, we read what we want to read. She went fishing for her opinion. Yeah. And sometimes in the news, if you go, I don't like the way they're doing that, you just turn to another network. Oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so most of them may be wrong, but it doesn't matter. All right, let's look at uh, John chapter one. It gets hard real quick. In the beginning, when in the world was the beginning? <laughs> Even Stephen Hawkins, who just died recently, a physicist, even when they ask him, where, how do you, where, what was before the Big Bang, and how do you tell how long things have been going on before that? He's, there's no way. He says, like, it's like answering what's south of the South Pole. You don't know. You don't know. So, so the, and the Big Bang is the way scientists have come to explain how things all of a sudden popped into existence. But it popped into existence because some things happened for some little particles that were there. Where did they come from? And I guess my, we won't get these questions answered in this lifetime. I don't think. <laughs> I've often wondered how many Big Bangs have there been? Mm -hmm. If God's been around forever, even this universe is 18 billion years old, what happened 400 billion years ago? What happened 600 billion years ago? And then you start getting such big numbers, I don't even know what to say. I forget what's beyond billions. Gazillions? <laughs> we got Gazillions. We yesterday. <laughs> billions and trillions. You go back trillions, I guess. What happened 900 trillion years ago? 
How many universes have there been? Because um, this says in the beginning, which to me is a generic term, as far back as this writer knows. And a lot of people think this is part of a hymn. In the beginning was the word. So, so here's that, the word. And then you might say, if that's all you read, you think in the beginning was the word. Well, I wonder what that word was. <laughs> um, so he's going to explain to us what he means by the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Now that even gets even more confusing. You stop thinking about it, doesn't it? In the beginning, which is a time I don't know what it, when it was. I can't put a definition on it. I know it was a long time ago. Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's always been. That didn't confuse me more. <laughs> <laughs> Everything we know has a, has a top starting time and a stopping time. It's about that. Interesting. I, I, somehow it's easier to understand that heaven goes on forever than it is to understand that, that forever has been going on the whole time. There was no start. That's, that's hard. That's hard for our, our human minds to comprehend. All right, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now that even gets now you even get more confused. He was he was with God. He was God. And he was with God in the beginning. And that he was with God again, he basically said, in the beginning was God. He said, was the word. And now he tells us he was with God and the word was with God in the beginning. Through him, the word, most he's not referring to Jesus, is he? he's referring to the word. Through him, all things were, he may be referring to Jesus, but not by name. Let me qualify that. Through him, all things were made without him. Nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Well, after we read that first few verses, we may feel like we're in darkness. <laughs> and it's hard to understand until you kind of work your way through it. But like I said, remember, if you want to understand verse one, you need to read all the verses in this book. To really understand prologue. And then it says, there came a man, now we're, going, now we're going to earth where we're much more comfortable. I think. Maybe not. Maybe not with all the stuff going on right now. But anyway, at least we have something tangible. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. You know, even today, if you said a man came to Mount Don, his name was John, you're like, who in the world was that? We've got a, we got, how many Johns live in Mount Don? Hello, John how many live in Henry County? How many live in the United States? We come to later know who he's talking about. But at first, you're like, if you're reading this book for the first time, here comes a man's name, John. All you know is his name's John. That, that, doesn't, that, doesn't, that doesn't limit it very much, does it? Because there might have been a lot of Johns back then. I mean, look at if you look in the Bible, how many Marys are there? Every woman seems to be named Mary. There was a Martha thrown in there, but there seems to be a lot of Marys. Anyway, there came a man who was sent from God's name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that life, so that men, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness. Now, John the Baptist is a witness. In this book, he distinguishes John the Baptist from being a forerunner to being a witness. There's a difference. He was a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. And then it says when he came, and now he's come. It says he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. John did recognize him. That's why he's important in the prologue. Since he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And you can look at that as man as his own, or you can look at that as people of Israel. But his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, that could be everybody now, 
to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, not of human decision, are a husband's will. Isn't that interesting terminology? Mm -hmm. But born of God. They had a choice. Most of us, how many of y'all made a decision before you were born and let your mom and dad know that you were ready to be born? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, look, man, it's time for me to get on earth. I've been waiting for, I've been waiting since in the beginning. <laughs> it's my time to show up. Or at least give me a shot at it anyway. <laughs> so we didn't have that choice. Nobody this morning had a choice before. And the parents have a choice. And that's one of the big issues we're dealing with in this country right now. We need to kind of settle how we're going to do that at some point in time. So we don't keep dividing up over that thing. But we all have a choice to become a child of God. That's the choice we have. The only ones that might not have a choice there are people who are born and are totally disabled and can't comprehend. And you just have to leave it to God to take care of them. But we have a choice to become a child of God. The Word became flesh. All right, so we're going back to the Word that was with God became flesh. The point that John is making, John is make, not making the point that, like a lot of people say, that Jesus was a man that born. He got to know God, so going to the synagogues, got to know a lot about God, and then he became a very famous prophet and did all kinds of things. And he evolved, as some say, into the son of, quote, the son of God, or being identified as the son of God. He is saying that he is God. He is God in the flesh. That this is how God came to earth is through the word. That makes Jesus even more special and unique. That this was just not another person that did what God wanted him to do. This was God becoming a person to reveal himself to human, humankind. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He came to be with people. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one known, who came from the Father, full and of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace is not mentioned much in this book, but it's mentioned here in the, uh, the initial part. And it says, John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. He was before all of us. He was before each of us. We know that he lived before us, but for the people that were already there, see this young, this young man that's there, he was around before they were. He who comes after me surpassed me because he was before me. And if you look at the synoptics, this is the difference. If you read the synoptics and you study it, John, John the Baptist clearly talks about Jesus in terms of he who comes after him. And he says that here too, but he, he also emphasizes he was before me. That's not a point of emphasis in the synoptic gospels. It is in John. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth, and we have that mentioned again, came through Jesus Christ. Came through the word. God is grace and truth. So Jesus is God. He has to be grace and truth. Grace and truth came through Jesus and he calls him Jesus Christ. And actually, if you read the prologue, we're in, we're in the last two words of verse 17. This is the first time we call him Jesus. And he calls him Jesus Christ. And, this, and he has John the Baptist doing the talk from here. It says, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. So he's, and that's his emphasis on Jesus being the incarnate God. That's what makes Jesus unique. He's not only seen God, he is the essence of God. 
this new is not there then. Because <laughs> you're thinking, all right, while God's on earth, where's God? Is God still in heaven and in earth? We don't need to limit God. Our, our minds, just like even the smartest physicists and scientists can't explain everything. It's amazing that even they came up with the Big Bang Theory. I think it's exciting when the scientists figure out what a wonderful world and the way this thing was developed. It really is. But we still can't understand everything. So we don't need to limit God by he has to be what I, I, can, I can understand. I still go back to my rescuing spiders and beetles out of the swimming pool. They don't have a clue what's happening. They don't know who I am. They don't understand me. And most of the frogs I've rescued, if they can get out of my hands when I grab them, they'll jump right back in the pool. I'm like, <laughs> come back. <laughs> still, I go after them. So. Last night I say too. I, I looked out the pool. I put the light on. What time was it? Because we didn't talk. Yeah, I was upstairs. I was upstairs. So I was having a fire. Yeah, you. Vicky woke up from the recliner downstairs and said, "I'm going to bed." So I stumbled down there for a few minutes. And I flipped the big floodlight on to look at the pool as I always do because you never know what you might find in the pool at night. And I saw this big, also this big wave. I think when I took the light on this. this this thing I rescued, <laughs> I, had to, I had to cut the alarm off and go out there. It's about 1230 at night. <laughs> Thankfully, it wasn't raining. I told Vicky, I said, well, I saved two frogs, but I never saved two frogs while they were made. <laughs> <laughs> they may not appreciate it. <laughs> Maybe the future generation will. <laughs> They were just doing what frogs do. Right? God created them too. So, I can't save every fish, but maybe I'll save two frogs. <laughs> One swoop. Uh, all right. Anyway, I digress. All right. So no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, His Father's side has made Him known. So this Gospel of John puts Jesus in a much more to me, unique light. And that to me is the beauty and the power of the Gospel of John. He, he is like from the day that kid was born, he was God. He was sent here with a mission. He did his mission. You know why he did it? Because he's God. God's going to be stick to what he's planning to do. He's not going to be here. Even the devil tempted him as we have those stories. Couldn't change what he was going to do. We're a little more flexible than that. Aren't we? <clears throat> we can do wrong things fairly easily, right? We get tempted and we think, hmm, that, that might be a good idea. No, maybe not. Maybe not. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> we get ourselves in a pickle. All right, now we're going to skip over to uh, basically the chapter four. There's a lot of good stuff in between, though. One of the things is in between where we're going. Because we're actually going to go study the second miracle. Does anybody remember God's Jesus? God and Jesus' mm -hmm. first miracle? And the wine. Water and wine. Water and the wine. You know, that's interesting. The gospel's got John the Baptist, and then it's got turned water into wine. <laughs> it just doesn't fit. The Baptist has a problem that's fully back. Why would Jesus turn water into wine? Why did he turn it into Coca Cola? <laughs> All right, I see his favorite. You know, <laughs> but the thing that the miracles in the Gospel of John show us, oh, and for people watching on YouTube, when you see people get up and leave, it's not because I've offended anybody. They're going to, I don't think I have, they're going to the choir. <laughs> anyway, so, but he turned water to wine. But when he do, does these miracles, he's showing me through those miracles. That Jesus is something we can't do. No man alive can take plain water. And by the time you take that water from one room to the next, it becomes the best wine in the world. You cannot do that. And I think one of the things that we need to remember as people 
and his TV ministers is we are not God. These miracles that God did in Jesus are God miracles. They're not something we can do. I cannot. The best scientist I know. Now, you might take water and start adding stuff and come up with something. But to just tell them, fill them up, and you take, take, fill up water, and you take it to the next room, and it's wine. Nobody can do that. That's not possible. But one of the things that tells us, it doesn't tell us that, hey, we won't be sure. We'll have some good wine. Uh, what that tells us is that, that, that Jesus is God, and we can have faith. Only God can do these things. So the perception should be for those who knew that that was water turned to wine. It's like, oh my God, nobody can do that. Only God can do that. That's that's still true today. You cannot take a barrel. You cannot get water out of your refrigerator and take it to your guest and have wine. Okay, you might get wine out of the refrigerator. I don't know. I don't drink wine. You keep wine in the refrigerator. One of you keep in the refrigerator. One of you don't. What do you keep? White wine in the refrigerator. Red wine you don't. Okay. Yeah. I was raised bad this <laughs> uh, Your name, John. <laughs> no. Remember, in my family, there's Daryl, Daryl, Daryl. My other brother, Daryl, my cousin, Daryl. Yes, four Daryls. Okay. Now, we're going to go to chapter 4, verse 23. We've got a little bit of time to do that. This is Jesus' next miracle in the Gospel of John. Now it says, after the two days he left for Galilee, and then we have this verse in parentheses. Now Jesus himself, so this is somebody telling you something, interjecting this into the story. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Now that's basically a quote from the Old Testament. And it says that he left for Galilee. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Now, Jesus was from Galilee, wasn't it? There's some problems with that verse interjected there because actually the people in around Galilee seem, in this book seem to really welcome him. So it's some, a little bit perplexing that Jesus had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country, yet he was, says, when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he'd done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, but they had also been there for the Passover. You know, a lot of people travel to the Passover, right? It says once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. So I'll let you know where you were in that past story. I don't think we didn't do the whole story. And there was a certain royal official who must have heard about this water turned into wine. Although I don't know the, the guy that drank the wine, they brought it to him. He just said, That's my good wine. You remember you saved the best wine for that. Which is opposite what most people do. Usually, they, he said, "Well, you know, usually after people are drunk, you bring the cheap wine." <laughs> That's what he says. That's what he said. He said, "And uh, all right." So there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. Now, this royal official may have not even been a Jew; could have been a, a Gentile, because there were some royal officials there in that area that didn't have to be Jewish. Just says a certain royal official, his son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. This man was desperate to get his son well. He was clinging to the hope that this man who he heard could do miracles could help his son. And then we have this quote um, from told. To us by Jesus in the book of John, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told you, you will never believe. You know, we still struggle with that today. There's a lot of people who won't believe and won't pray to God. They won't pray to God until they want a miracle and they won't believe that they don't receive it or see it. It says, the royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. He's undeterred by Jesus' comment. And it, um, Jesus replied, you may go, your son will live. 
Now, he didn't even go lay hands on. He didn't even mail you a white handkerchief or say, come touch the TV. Right? You didn't even have to mail him money. <laughs> See, <thank you. laughs> Jesus said, you may go, your son will live. Jesus doesn't want anything for this man because Jesus loves this man. Jesus loves this child. Because God loves all his children. Why not love what they do? But he loves his children. The man took Jesus at his word. It's a good thing. And departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. Uh, now, he hadn't died, remember? He says he's appointed that. Now, later in this book, we take it a step further. Who does he raise from the dead in this book? Lazarus. Lazarus. And guess what? <clears throat> that story's only in John. <clears throat> you go, your son will live. The son, all right, so he's, he's alive. And then when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. And then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. I don't know how they got those facts back then, but that's when it happened. But apparently, remember this is written down many years later. The word was that at the same time that Jesus told him that, that the son got well. Jesus has said to him, your son will live. So he and all his household believe. So that man received two miracles. His son came to back to life, or, or was made well and continued to live because he's going to die. What's the second miracle he got? He got a second miracle. Time? Faith in God Almighty. Oh. Faith in God Almighty. He, that's a miracle. He got he 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 this man didn't have that. Did he? he just he was desperate to have, have somebody he heard who could do miracles heal his son. So the second miracle was, and maybe the more important than the first, was that he and his son could have faith in the eternal God who was there in the beginning and was and always will be. He says, this was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed having come from Judah to Galilee. So any questions or discussion? <laughs> it's a powerful gospel. It's very distinctly different from the other gospel. Uh, there are some common scriptures. Uh, but it's a powerful gospel to study. And you read commentaries that don't all agree with each other. <laughs> Since when have you been separate read on everything, right? But, uh, but the key thing in the book sets the tone in the prologue is to realize that Jesus was God incarnate. Not just another man walking the streets of Jerusalem, wandering through the wilderness and going up to Galilee. Not someone who just reported he did this, that, and the other thing. But somebody who was God. And that to me is, uh, if you understand it through that, uh, that's very powerful. Um, so God showed us when he comes to earth and when he's with us, there are no limits of what he can do. And we, we would like to have it. So we go, why don't you come back down? We need some really big help now to make things better. Um, and I don't know how he will answer that. Right? And he may show up tomorrow. I don't know. All right. Well, let's, let's close with prayer. And then next week, we're still studying John the rest of this month, by the way. And I'm teaching next Sunday. In case you don't want to read the rest, let's see. We're going we're gonna to jump to John 12. So, the word saves. Dear God, thank you for this powerful lesson and this powerful gospel. It teaches us how to understand you in some tangible way. When, when you 
through Jesus showed us who you are, how you love us, how you help us, and how you want us to respond to you. We're thankful for that. Go with us in our struggles. Amen. Amen. See y'all next week. Go forth and go forth and ponder. <laughs> Do you happen to know how Jackie's doing? I have not talked to Jackie. I know she wasn't doing well last Sunday when I talked to her, but she wanted me to come to you. Yeah. Uh, I, I I think Jackie's concerned. We're gonna we make we're gonna probably. <laughs>